Dragons. They're the quintessential fantasy monsters and the ultimate goal of many a questing knight or other valiant monster slayer. Large or small, bestial or intelligent, friendly or fearsome, dragons are found in cultures from all around the globe. You can find them in books, movies, television shows, anime, video games. Basically, if there's a form of media, chances are you'll find dragons in them somewhere. In many places, they've leapt from stories into the real world, influencing decorations, architecture, art, and birth statistics? We're currently in the year of the dragon in the Chinese zodiac, which repeats every 12 years. In recent years of the dragon, birth rates in parts of Asia with strong Chinese populations have spiked as parents aim to have their children be born under such an auspicious sign. As you might expect, a creature this ubiquitous and awe-inspiring has spawned a number of theories about its origins. The earliest records of what we might call dragons go back many thousands of years and can be found in ancient Mesopotamia, India, and Greece, to name just a few. But their true origins, or rather the reason why humans created the myth of dragons itself, is older still, possibly much older, dating back to long before anything was written down or before modern humans even existed. In this video, I'll take a look at some of the theories behind the origins of dragons, as well as trying to figure out where their most iconic power comes from. The fossilized remains of large extinct animals like mammoths and dinosaurs were embedded in the earth thousands or millions of years ago, but it's only in recent centuries that they've been excavated and studied by humans. Right? Not so much. It turns out that the ancients not only discovered these giant bones, but offered theories as to their origins. A few correctly identified them as normal animals that existed long before humans, but the more common response was to identify them as the remains of great heroes such as the legends of the Trojan War, or as monsters such as giants, griffins, centaurs, and dragons. In her book The First Fossil Hunters, Adrienne Mayer relays many accounts of ancient Greek and Roman writers who saw these giant bones as indisputable evidence that enormous animals once walked the earth. Technically they were right, even if they were a little off base when it came to the exact nature of those animals. According to the 3rd century scholar Philostratus, India is girt with dragons of enormous size. Not only are the marshes full of them, but the mountains as well, and not a single ridge is without one. They say that in the skulls of the mountain dragons are stored stones of flowery colors that flash out all kinds of hues. These gemstones, perhaps an early interpretation of a dragon's treasure hoard, were thought to be crystallized mineral deposits on the bones. In any event, you can't take a look at this fossil from India, which is actually of an ancestor of the giraffe, and tell me it doesn't look like a dragon's skull. The Chinese referred to fossilized bones, even those from recognizable animals, as dragon bones, and sold them for a healthy profit as they were used in folk remedies by ancient apothecaries. Paleontologist Kenneth Oakley believes that the horns seen on the skulls of these bones might have influenced the popular image of the Chinese dragon. Much later, the town of Klagenfurt in Austria was supposedly founded on the site where a group of heroes slew a dragon in the 1200s. A century later, the dragon's skull was discovered, and sometime around 1600, a fountain in the form of a dragon was created for the city, where it still rests to this day. The skull they found was actually that of a woolly rhinoceros that perished during the last ice age, but it shows that, even as recently as a few hundred years ago, giant bones could be equated with dragons. These ancient bones could be the source of dragon myths going back tens of thousands of years, but there are parts of the world where giant fossils are virtually unknown, such as Scandinavia, and yet there are still myths of dragons in those places. So what other theory could account for that? The earliest records we have of dragons largely identify them as serpentine in nature. Ancient Egyptian and Mesopotamian art depict giant snakes, and Chinese artifacts dated to around 6000 BC exhibit both serpentine and dragon-like qualities. The earliest known written reference to dragons is believed to come from an ancient Sumerian plaque dating to around 2000 BC and bearing the word Usum Gal. Gal means big and Usum means snake, but according to University of Michigan professor J. Christostomo, the Usum Gal also resembles a lion, or at least some kind of large predator. He calls the Usum Gal, quote, a powerful, awe-inspiring creature imbued with legend and a bit of mystery, which is a pretty good description of a dragon. Dragon-like serpents feature as divine beings in a number of myths, such as the Greek Typhon and the Aztec Quetzalcoatl, while other mythological serpents are more commonly identified as dragons, such as the Norse Fafnir and Nidhogg, who were long and snake-like in their earlier depictions. In fact, worm is often used to describe a dragon in Norse myths, suggesting a slithering, serpentine body. And the Latin word draco, meaning snake, 
is clearly a precursor to the English dragon and its cousin the drake. By the way, the root of the word draco itself means to watch, referring to a serpent's transparent eyelids, a trait that was probably also passed on to dragons who were ever watchful of their treasure. And there have been some studies linking dragons, especially ones seen as guardians of water, with rainbows, which are long and curved, much like a snake. So why do so many dragon myths seem to have their roots in snakes and other predatory animals? A great number of people are afraid of snakes, and it's possible that some part of this instinct was hard-coded into our ape brains that we inherited from our ancestors, leading humans to create monstrous dragons out of giant serpents and other predators. That's the conclusion reached by several scientists, most notably Carl Sagan, who believed that ancient predators were the genesis of dragon myths. The pervasiveness of dragon myths in the folk legends of many cultures is probably no accident. Could the pervasive dreams and common fears of monsters, which children develop shortly after they are able to talk, be evolutionary vestiges of quite adaptive, baboon-like, responses to dragons and owls? Anthropologist David E. Jones followed up on Sagan's 1977 book in his 2000 book, An Instinct for Dragons. Jones argues that a trio of early predators preyed on our smaller ape ancestors, leading to the creation of dragons as a universal monster myth. Before art, before religion, before philosophy, before any of those distinctly human behaviors that our kind had developed over the millennia could become manifest, the issue of defense against the traditional primate predators had to be settled. Primates had to evolve significant alarm calls and innate and therefore automatic responses to alarm calls, or to predator signature behavior, the writhing of snakes, the rush of the leopard attack, and the fluttering of bird wings, to assure that a sufficient number survived to maintain a steady rate of population. The dragon evolved from the same crucible that produced the most fundamental of human institutions, those that we share with almost all primates. It's not hard to see dragons as a composite of the three types of predators Jones mentions, snakes for their reptilian form and scales, birds of prey for their wings and dive bomb attacks, and giant cats for their skill at prowling and stalking their prey. Plus, who hasn't had a cat that's lounged around on your favorite chair and jealously guarded it like a pile of gold? Those are two theories as to the origins of dragons and myth, but they don't really account for a dragon's most iconic power, breathing fire. No real animal, whether prehistoric like dinosaurs or modern like snakes, breathes fire, so where did that come from? The answer might be from hell. No, not the letter from Jack the Ripper or the graphic novel by Alan Moore, but actual hell. Dragons are all over the Book of Revelations in the Bible, and if we go with the serpents equals dragons myth, the great leviathan described in the Book of Job is very dragon-like. Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth." Because of all this, medieval Christians associated dragons with Satan and evil, and art often depicted the mouth of hell as a literally mouth-shaped opening with all sorts of unpleasantness spewing forth, including naturally the fires of hell. But how did fire-breathing dragons come about in places before contact with Christianity or Judaism? One example comes from the indigenous Seneca people of North America. Gassiandietha was said to be a giant water-dwelling dragon serpent that could fly through the sky on a trail of fire and also breathe fire itself. Called the meteor dragon, it may have been the Seneca people's way of explaining a fiery meteor darting through the night sky. It makes sense that such a beast could also produce its own fire. Meanwhile, the mythical Turkish dragon known as the Evren puts a twist on the fire-breathing cliché by not only shooting fire from its mouth, but also from its tail. As for the most well-known style of dragons outside of the European prototype, Chinese dragons typically don't breathe fire. Some of them have control over fire or other elements like water or wind, but they rarely expel flames from their bodies. Also, they tend to be more like deities to be revered rather than monsters to be slain. And we have the dragons as rainbows theory, as rainbows generally come after storms which have lightning that can start fires. Maybe those last two examples can provide us with some clues. When a disaster like a typhoon or flood or a wildfire hit China, for instance, the people thought it was because their dragon deities were displeased. Along with predatory animals, natural disasters like fires, whether set by people or lightning, have been a danger to humans for basically forever, especially once we started living in densely packed settlements. So maybe it's only natural that we should combine a fear of those two deadly hazards to create fire-breathing dragons as a universal notion that transcends religion or geographical location. Monsters and natural disasters are hurdles to be overcome, 
requiring brave people with the will to face down impossible odds. So is it any wonder that we might combine the two to create a deadly monster like a fire-breathing dragon? Psychologist Carl Jung labeled the dragon a manifestation of our unconscious thought, filling the role of a, quote, painful and dangerous intervention in our affairs and its frightening effects, just like a natural disaster or other sudden calamity. In that way, the creation of fire-breathing dragons mirrors that of one of the most famous modern monsters. Godzilla was first conceived by Japanese filmmakers in the 1950s as a metaphor for the atomic bombs dropped in their country during World War II, less than a decade prior. Only by banding together, with the help of a valiant knight or eccentric genius scientist, can we prevail against, or at least endure, such a dangerous and destructive enemy. Whatever their exact source, dragons have been with us for a long time and will be for a long time to come, if current media is any indication. They might not be real, but that doesn't mean they're not born of real problems that have plagued humankind in the distant and not so distant past. Whatever dragons you have to face in your daily lives, I hope you'll overcome them like the stereotypical medieval knight in shining armor. Unless they're really cute, in which case you should adopt them, train them, and unleash them on your enemies when they're fully grown. Thank you so much for watching my video about the origins of dragons. I hope you'll click the like button and subscribe to my channel for more content about the origins of fantasy. See you next time!